I lied, we're still in this file. Uh, we want to show, before we leave, I want to show setting up lighting, which is extremely important, obviously, to any sort of rendering. So we'll go to the Sade view list, and we'll choose setting up lighting, heliodon, and directional lights, which are basically the same thing. This should take us to an OpenGL render in just a moment. There we are. Now you can already sort of see some shadowing here. Uh, the easiest way to control lights, however, is to go to the window menu, palettes, and turn on visualization. You can see I already have a number of lights actually in this document, but the only one turned on right now is a heliodon, which is I've just set up here for an easy light. It's generally easier for exterior renderings especially just to use one heliodon. But unless you have one of the architectural or landmark or spotlight packages, you won't have a heliodon. So we can use just a directional light instead. We'll just treat it as if we had fundamentals with RenderWorks. So go ahead and turn off this heliodon object. It'll go dark there, and we can close this palette for now. That will just shrink it. A little yellow button to collapse the palette. On Windows, there'll be a little pin on the top right. You can click that so that the palette will shade shut. Now go back into the visualization tool set and click on the light tool. Now you can change the mode afterward, but generally when you're placing it, it'll let you focus it properly if you start with the mode you want. So we're going to start with the directional light. We're not going to change any settings. We're just going to place it just right over here is fine. We're going to let it turn on. The color white is fine. We don't need to change that for now. We do want it to cast shadows, and in OpenGL, the soft shadows won't matter. But generally, for your lights, you'll want to try soft shadows if your shadow lines seem a little too stark. Our light has shown up, but we can't see it. We don't see where the actual light object is. That's very common, and it's easy to fix. Go to Tools, Options, and Vectorworks Preferences. Under the Display tab, where it says Display Light Objects, change this to Always if it isn't there already. It should default to that setting, but just in case, turn this to Always and click OK. You'll see a number of things show up. Here's that heliodon we had before. And here's the directional light we just chose. Now you'll see two reshape handles on here. And if you hover over them, they'll give you a little different icon with your cursor. If I click this lower one, I can change the direction the sun's facing. And if I click the second one, I can change this, the angle of it, how steep it is or how high the light is in the sky. You can use more than one directional light, but generally, since directional lights will just be all light coming from one direction and going infinitely in the other, it's best to just use this for the sun and not much else. If you try to use more than one directional light, your shadows will get very strange. You won't really see what's happening, but it'll be a little confusing. A heliodon object works fairly much the same. It's basically just a complicated directional light object where you can actually set what time it is, where you are in the world, and what date. But that's not necessary for just doing the lighting. It's just a little easier to use than a directional light, which has fewer options. I will change it here because it'll be the most obvious. If I click color, you can simply tone this a particular direction. You don't generally want to do crazy heavy lighting in a crazy heavy color because you'll get something creepy like this. It's great for a spotlight document or a stage design or theater, but not for exterior lighting. Generally something like a nice yellow or a nice blue there we are. We'll give you the effect you're looking for. And you can just turn it to a darker orange or something like that if you want to get a little more sunset looking. There we are. Anything like that. You can really just tone it the way you'd like. And we'll go ahead and delete this object now. We won't need it anymore. Now we'll head inside and go to the saved views. 3.3 3, setting up lighting point lights. You see now this takes us inside our document. So we're in a stairwell. This looks outside. But right here we have two little points where we have recessed lighting in the ceiling. And we can just add light to those points. So click the light tool again and click the second mode, the point light. The point light works, like the icon suggests, like a light bulb. It's just going to be one point of light emitting in all directions from that point. We'll go ahead and place this here. And we're actually a little low, so we'll just pan up slightly. I'm using the middle mouse button, but you can also use spacebar. We can see we already have a light here. So we'll go ahead and put another light right here. We'll go ahead and turn on soft shadows for this. That's fine. Click OK. There we are. You can see the light comes in, and the light emits evenly from that point in all directions. You can see this fence here. It casts that nice shadow along the stairwell. Now, this light here isn't turned on. We can tell because if we turn this one off, 
it gets very dark, and if we click on it, it'll tell us that that light is off in the Object Info Palette. Turning this on will give us sort of the same look, but since it's from a different direction, it'll give us that nice shading across the stairs. We can select both and turn them both on, but in OpenGL, you can only have a maximum of eight lights. So this is two of our maximum of eight. If we had a Heliodon, that would be a third, so we'd only have five left. So when you're working in OpenGL, you generally want to just keep the lights on that you're working on. It'll keep the render fast if you have shadows turned on, as well as you're limited to eight. So you need to stay below that limit. Otherwise, the first light you turned on will turn off. If you turn nine lights on, you'll only get the last eight. The RenderWorks modes, of course, support any number of lights, so it won't be a problem. We'll go ahead and turn both these lights off. And then what I'll do is just to show you, you can change the mode afterward. So here in the Object Info Palette, there's the kind of light. We can change that from point to spot. A spot is a little similar to directional in that it'll create a directional, it'll create a light that's designed to be aimed in a particular direction. That's still off, and we'll turn that on. You can see we have this pool of light, and it only emits in one direction. Let's see how we can turn this around live here. We don't have to change anything else. We can just aim this at whatever we'd like. You can change lights around this way and aim them that direction. It's generally a good idea to use this sort of light when you're using recessed lighting. Like this would generally aim straight down. So rather than try to find how to manually move it straight down, we can scroll down the Object Info Palette. And pan is the direction it moves left to right. Tilt is the direction it moves up and down. If we make this 90, the light will look straight down. Generally, recessed lightings are going to look that way. However, you can see here that it's not casting against the wall here. That's because the spread is a little too low. We can change these values manually. There, now you can see that it splits against the wall here. Now, the spread and the beam. The spread is sort of the soft fade that the light will have. So if I increase, see how we have a strong edge right now on this light? The spread and the beam are matched. So the beam, which is the thick main part of the light, is exactly at the same edge as the spread. So there won't be any like light fade as it goes away from it. If we make this larger, we'll make that 100. You can see we get that sort of fuzzing on the edge here. And if we make this even smaller, that fuzzing area goes larger, so that fade. It looks a little more natural this way. And that's also how you can get spotlights to cast along a wall like that. So if we do the same thing to this light, we'll turn this light on. We'll change it to a spotlight. We will aim it straight down as well. And we'll do the same thing with the spread. We'll make this one 100 and this one 80. There we are, and you can see you get that nice lighting effect of just the light coming down from the ceiling. That works much better than trying to take a spotlight and cramming it up inside the recessed lighting, even though in real life, a real light bulb would generally be up in there. Trying to work with the reflectivity of a fixture and getting the light to shine down because you've reflected it down isn't as easy as simply installing spotlights and then having them spread this way. It just looks much more realistic and it's much easier to accomplish. That'll do it for spotlights. But there's something else we do want to change that is about lighting, but it's a little different. We'll go to the Saved View 3.3, Setting Up Lighting, Set Lighting Options. And we'll go ahead and turn these other lights off. It's still left over here. Now, we don't want to see these light objects anymore. So we'll go to Tools, Options, Vectorworks preferences, and under the display tab, we'll change this display light objects to only in wireframe and click OK. There, now we won't have that widget out there anymore. What we're going to do now is go to view and set lighting options. This will let us control, and we see this before, it also is included in RenderWorks styles, but now we'll explain really what it's for. So it gives an even light to everything in the document, no matter if it's under something or shadowed or shaded, it will show up regardless. If we turn ambient lighting all the way to zero, we will see nothing. We will only see the light coming from the RenderWorks background, that sky out there. But we can turn that slowly up, and you can see everything evenly lights as we turn it all the way up. And if you wanted to deal with light not at all, you would turn this all the way up, and you'd see every color perfectly clean with no changes to it whatsoever. But for rendering, this is generally bad. We'll turn this down a little bit. 
and we're going to cover ambient occlusion next. But to make it a little more obvious, click OK to this menu. Go to the saved views again. And now go to setting up lighting 3.5, setting up lighting ambient occlusion. And this is a pre-saved set of OpenGL settings that I've set up for you. Where we don't have colors and we don't have textures. See how it's very difficult to see the difference between the objects? The object highlighting shows us the objects, but you can't really see what's going on. This is, of course, what would happen if there was no texture and no color, but also no shadow. But we can change this by going to the view, set lighting options again, and in here, we'll enable ambient occlusion. See what happened? Ambient occlusion attempts to add that darkness that happens when you have two surfaces next to each other. You see it in real life, whether you think about it or not, if you look in the corner of a room that you're in at the moment. Ambient occlusion in OpenGL is live. You can change it on the fly. So I can increase this intensity up to 100% if I want, but then it becomes very obvious at how strong it is and how it's fading too much. It sort of looks dirty more than a shadow feature. So we can reduce its size. Drop this down to 0.5 meters, a little better. In fact, backspace and drop it down to 0.1 meter. That looks much better. That's much cleaner. And we'll drop the strength down a little bit to 80. Eh, make it 40. There we are. Now that edging will stay, even if we turn colors and draw edges back on. It gives your view a little more of an edge to it. The main thing to keep in mind about ambient inclusion is that it is emulating what it would look like if you enabled indirect lighting and turned it up to something like 8 bounces like we did in our final render for the interior. Ambient occlusion will work in OpenGL, and it is very good at doing it quickly, but it's not going to be accurate all the time. It's assuming every edge needs ambient occlusion, every edge of every object, which in this scene looks okay. But in scenes where you have a lot of curvy objects or you have a lot of objects that have different textures and they interact with each other, for instance, you wouldn't get this ambient occlusion on an edge that had a chrome teapot sitting on top of a shiny glass table. You wouldn't have that shading in there. But ambient occlusion doesn't know that. It does every edge. So if you're looking for a real realistic rendering of this, you would use indirect lighting in a RenderWorks mode. And ambient occlusion, generally, you stick that to OpenGL or if you don't feel like waiting for the indirect lighting to calculate. Click OK. We're done with that. And now we truly are done with this file. Uh, feel free at any time, either before we go on to the next videos, to just go through these saved views. A lot of the views have been prepared specifically to demonstrate what we did when we went through them. But you can go through them, use them how you like, make viewports from them, experiment with artistic render works and realistic rendering modes, and just get an idea with it. Rendering is not an exact science. It is far more of an art than the other elements of Vectorworks. Renderworks is, I think, significantly more fun, but it does take a lot of experience with it in order to get what you want without having to guess a few times. You just get used to it over time. Okay, now this time I promise we're done with this document. In the next video, we'll be moving to an exterior landscaping scene to discuss textures and a few other parts of Renderworks.